Welcome to the Janine Boland Show, where we share tips from around the globe as we guide practical people with their finances using money tips, increase their incomes through side businesses, and maintain their sanity by staying in their creative zone. This is Janine Bolin, and I am so grateful that you are here on the show with me today. One of the things I absolutely love about being a radio show personality and host is the fact that I get to talk to other cool, amazing radio show hosts. And we happen to have with us today Dr. Vic Starnes and Rebecca Starnes, who happen to be a part of the KHNC family with Dr. Vic, how's it going on? So let's start with Rebecca, because, you know, as we know, there's always a powerful person behind the throne, behind the front man, and she is it. Rebecca is from the Midwest and a former Montessori teacher and business owner. She believes in freedom in every sense of the word. Every person, each individual, has a valuable voice and is integral to our part of the world. Just as energy of freedom is growth, so is the energy of forests, rivers, oceans, animals, and all of nature. Now, that's what Rebecca likes to bring to the program. The thing that Dr. Vic likes to bring to the program is he's a doctor of management from Colorado Tech University. He currently has a radio program called Dr. Vic. How's it going on? And teaching uh, teaches project management classes at Colorado Tech. As a research scientist, he is researching topics on behavioral science and human intuition. Dr. Vic is a freedom-loving, patriotic American who would never trade freedom for security. I want to say welcome you both to the show. Thank you. Thank you. So let's go ahead and just launch right in. One of the things I love is there's always a story behind the story. And so we're going to start with you, Dr. Vic. Talk to us about this show. Dr. Vic, how's it going on? And then we're going to talk about how Rebecca happens to blend in her skill set as well. So if you don't mind, what's the story behind this show? What, why did you even start it? Well, we kind of uh, fell into it. We, um, you know, can khnc has a uh they're one of their uh people that own it are uh, patriot gold um so we bought some gold from uh from the company and we were up talking to jason uh, walker and you know he was talking about doing radio shows i said well, i'd like to do a radio show i'd i'd like to do one to get out you know what i think about things and uh you know we talked about it me and rebecca and she was behind it but when we started, she didn't want anything to do with being on air at all. She said, no, nope, not going to do it at your show. You just do it the way you want to do it. And so she would come up with me and uh, she would sit across and she, with the headphones on. And she had a live mic if she wanted to use it. And I would see that look at her eye like, I really want to say something about this. So I'd say, Rebecca, what do you think? You know? And then she would tell me, it, you know, and. You know, I, I kind of wanted to keep it more business and not so political, but you can't really do business and without addressing politics and things that are uh, happening in the world. I got the name, Dr. Vic, of course, but how's it going on? My One of my really good friends is from Saudi Arabia, and he would call me up and say, hi, Dr. Vic, how's it going on? You know, and so I kind of looked into that and what it really means, like, what I like to say it means is, how are we moving forward? How do we move forward? This is what's going on. How do we move forward? How do we, how do we find solutions for this? Um, my, my reason I got my doctorate was I was very frustrated in the business world and project management and you know people making the same mistakes over and over again. Uh, something would happen in a project and the whole team would go into fight or flight or freeze. <laughs> freeze so sometimes, I, yes, sometimes freeze, frozen yeah. in place. You got it. <laughs> so I would, what I like to teach the people that I'm working with and my students is that you can, you can train your brain to when these things happen, to take that deep breath, whether it's real or imaginary and go into solution mode. You don't have to stay in the fight or flight. You can automatically go into solution and, you know, our brains are geared to do that if we train them. Um, uh, so 
that was one of the things that got me into the show. I like to talk about business. I like to talk about investments. I like to talk about doing, uh, doing real world work. And, you know, I was frustrated with project management and, and I tell people that go in the doctoral program in business, I'll say, well, what was your pet peeve when you were in business? And they would tell me, and I would say, that's your dissertation. How do we, how do we solve this? How do we find a solution for that? <laughs> and, and, say, that well, and that was what made it rock and roll from that point on. So, hey, Rebecca, I wanted to bring you in too. So tell us your story behind the story because, yeah, Dr. Vic, it's his radio show. You were going to totally be, you know, the supportive, yeah, go, honey, make this happen. And then he's putting headphones on you and gives you a live mic. Now, that's a very hard thing to resist. Talk to us a little bit about how you came through on that. Well, like he said, I was there as a support person, but would get excited over different points and want to throw in my two cents. And um, I get very passionate about things. And I, I appreciate Vic. He's like calm, cool, collected. But I get I get kind of fired up. And um, when I see something that I think is just very wrong, very incorrect that's going on, I like to point it out because um, that's that's my belief. I feel like some people don't see something that is so out of sorts right in front of us. Maybe we're just used to it, and I'm kind of like that barking chihuahua, like, you know, look at this, look at this. It's one of those things that, well... One of the things as a homeschooler, because I homeschooled my four children, and when they got to high school level, I gave them an opportunity. I said, I can continue to be your, your teacher, or we can have you run through a variety of either charter schools or public school, because my, I always felt, my children, you are in charge of your own education. If you don't learn how to think by the time you hit high school level, that's going to be a challenge for you the rest of your life. So the Montessori method teaches us, right, that nothing is more powerful than a free thinking individual. And you do everything through the Montessori technique, who happened to be a doctor who wrote 124 volumes on how to educate the young. I mean, this woman was amazing for her time. So the fact that you're trained in that, talk to us a little bit about how that training kind of defined for you how you would like to present information to people. Well, and I, I love that you did that with your children, Janine. And uh, I think it's about self-actualization, uh, letting people uh, make an error, be self-correcting. And that's just the best way to learn is when we do something ourselves. And uh, as a teacher in the Montessori classroom, uh, we would demonstrate the proper way to do things and then allow the child to pick up on that and build on their strengths. So I guess I do incorporate that a little bit into my relationships with um, family and friends and, and probably on the radio also. Yeah, you're used to demonstrating. So I always find it fascinating when I got when I first was chatting with the two of you, you have this Montessori based teacher who is very that's hands on. That's like very kinesthetic students thrive in that system, right? Because I'm doing finally, I'm not having to sit and just listen, I can do. And then here you have Dr. Vic, who's like, yeah, let's talk about behaviors that are totally malleable in the human brain, if you would just be aware. So you guys brought up self-actualization. So Maslow, we all love Maslow on that regard, right? So Dr. Vic, talk to us a little bit about what your dear beloved is saying regarding self-actualization. What is that and why is that important for people like you? Well, for me, um, and I've been doing this for a long time and, you know, I read, uh, I read a lot about, you know, personal mastery. I, I actually practice it. I actually people I mentor, that's one of the top subjects we talk about is uh, self-actualization. Um, you know, Mas Maslow, he had a quote that said, you can either step forward into growth or step backward into safety. And I really like that. And I have that on my announcements and for my students. Um, and I, I put that in there <laughs> because we have a tendency to want to just be safe and we don't want to step out. Um, doing the doctoral program, it was a no brainer for me. I had 
you know, I had met the people and I had the, I had the dissertation ready. I did my, I did my doctorate in three years. So I started writing my dissertation on day one and I started doing the research. I started doing everything I needed to do. And, you know, it works in business, self-actualization. When you teach that to people, when you, when you let people become their higher self, when you give them the chance to challenge themselves to step out into a job that they're not sure of, but you just tell them that you will make mistakes, but it's okay. So it's uh, one of the things that I like to, that I've worked on myself about. And, you know, I, I used to tell people, me and Rebecca got, the reason we got along so well is that she was a kindergarten Montessori teacher and that helped with our relationship. <laughs> Keeps it very basic. Now, when we come back, I'm, we're going to go to our sponsors here for a minute. But when we come back, we're going to hear Rebecca's side of it. We're going to talk about self-actualization because that's one of the most powerful things any individual can do, not only for themselves and their own personal relationships, but if you want to change a community, become self-actualized. We'll talk about that after the break. And welcome back. And I am here with Dr. Vic Starnes and Rebecca Starnes of the radio show, Dr. Vic. How's it going on as we move forward and describe and discuss self-actualization? Now, a lot of people are used to Ma uh, Maslow and his hierarchy of needs. But one of the things a lot of people don't know is that he had a 12-step program before the Al Alcoholics Anonymous. You know, he was, he was doing 12 steps back then. So we'd like Rebecca, since you're the Montessori teacher, and yes, I know kindergarten, but like they say in pretty much every culture, it's like, it's, we got to get back to rice and beans is what some cultures say, or we, it's all about the noodles. What you learn in kindergarten is extremely important. So talk to us a little bit about self-actualization, what it means to you, and how you've integrated uh, Maslow's 12-step program in your own life? Well, uh, thanks for the question. I've been thinking lately about reconnecting, like how we can reconnect with ourselves. I noticed that people get very attached to their electronics and uh, there'll be a beep or a tone and people will just leap, you know, leap to grab the phone because they're so wired into that. And I think we have kind of an inherent uh, internet within ourselves. And you've probably experienced this on all your listeners. You're thinking about maybe your cousin or, or a good girlfriend. And then all of a sudden they call you. You know, there, there is that connectivity that we have uh, with the people and, and the world at large. And I think it's so important to tap into that, that it's an actual power. It's a resource that we can use listening to ourself and doing the things, you know, like you can go to places in, um, I know around uh, Colorado where I live, 
You can go to places where you can detox, detox from the electronics, you know, kind of get back to basics. You were talking about noodles or the rice, um, you know, the root, you know, the root of our uh, connectivity to spirit or the universe or your higher power um, and ourselves, you know, having that connection to where, um, you know, we can see where we're going. We can, we can realize what's important to us and what we want. Does that answer your question? It does. And so Maslow talks about these 12 steps of self-actualization. And the reason I'm hitting on this so much is because when we were first talking before we had the show, uh, we were talking about how we want to bring our communities together. We want very much to bring the ability to have very intelligent yet calm dialogue. And we were talking about, even if we talk politics, even if we're in disagreement with each other, that there are ways through self-actualization to be able to have uh, a calm dialogue, which is not seen when you're on the internet or you're looking at YouTube comments or what have you. And so I would love for the two of you, we'll go with Dr. Vic first, and then Rebecca will follow up with you. Talk to us about some of the things you use from self-actualization and the 12 steps of Maslow on what you do in your communities to create that dialogue. And even if there is disagreement, how do you go about moving through that? So Dr. Vic. Thank you. <laughs> you know, for me, I've been I've been intuitive ever since I was a small child, and I they would call it today um, ADHD. As if you wanted me to sit in a chair, you might as well duct tape me to it. <laughs> and someone would walk by the window, and I'd get up and go see where they were going, and they'd say, "Are you listening?" And I'd say, "No, I'm not." And they'd put me out in the coat rack. So I had a very I always tell people that. Um, school was the roughest 12 years of my life. And later on, as I went back to school, I, I started to enjoy it. I went to Colorado Tech as a, as a uh, applied learning university where what you learn today, you can use um, tomorrow. So with my intuition, when people would tell me stuff and I knew it wasn't right, I would just, okay, and I'd just ignore it because or I'd find out why they were saying that. And I didn't buy into everything they told me in school. And it was just crazy. So I use in, in my personal life and in my communities, I just talk to people. I say, what if this was going on? Or how would you handle a situation if you found out this, would ha this had happened? And I do that in my business, in my classes. And when I consult people, I, I do a consulting call. It's a combination of action research and uh, um, process consultation. And uh, let's see, there's another one. I can't bring it off top of my head. But what I do when I consult with them is the first thing I ask them, I say, tell me a story of what you do well. What, what project, what part of your business did you do well? And they would tell me and they'd be really excited. I said, well, why'd you quit doing that? That's what you do well. Well, we had to keep up with the competition. I said, well, you wanna be ahead of the competition, but you wanna be ahead of it in what you do well. And so I get companies back on track. I get people back on track. Um, quit trying to do what other people are doing. Do what you do well, do what you feel. You know, personal, you know, self-actualization. What, what makes you tick? What do you do, you know? And interesting enough, if you've ever read uh, Peter Singe's book, uh, The Fifth Discipline, around page 53, he says the best program for personal mastery is the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. So that was interesting. It's like, well, that's a 12-step program. That's like Maslow's 12-step. And, you know, you have to, and I tell people using Maslow's scale is if you're not thriving at the level you're at, go back to the level below and thrive there and then try it again. <laughs> you know? Right. Because you and I both know that successful people, all successful people know this. How did you become successful? I failed really well. I failed a lot and I got to where I would fail faster than the guy beside me. And that's how I became the master of my field. 
right? And a lot of people are like, what are you talking about? I said, ask any athlete. They fail every day, but they're back on the track making it happen because, you know, they have these bars, you know, people talk about your stretch goals and all that. I'm like, what if you know you're going to fail? People like to say, so what do you know if you, if you couldn't fail, what would you go after, right? That's another way of phrasing what we're talking about. But I just wanted to let you know, a lot of times it's fail faster, you know, you're not, you're not trying enough things. You're not, uh, if you're not thriving, it's because you have limited yourself sometimes. And I love then there's also an equally powerful metaphor that Dr. Vic talks about, which is go back, like go back to rice and beans, go back to the basics. What were you really, really good at? And sometimes that's a much better starting point. Okay. What do I enjoy doing? What's exciting? So Rebecca, we'd love to hear your two cents on this about your personal work that you do for your self-actualization and then how you create a uh, wonderful dialogue with community on that, right? You know, because that's what we're really all about here in radio is we're building community and being able to help people understand how to go about having civil conversations. Thank you. Uh, I think building on strengths as far as a community like meeting on that common ground, all the things that we can actually relate to. And, um, you know, listening, you know, really listening to other people about what they need and where they're coming from. And I think most people can always relate to another person on some level, you know, starting there where um, there's some warmth and caring and just human concern and, you know, starting there, I think it takes away a lot of those rough edges of, of the politics and, um, you know, possible disagreements. There's a lot of polarization going on in the world, you know, left, right. Um, I mean, just all of that where people can get stuck. And I think it's important to, uh, you know, meet in the middle as much as we can. And, and I love meeting in person. I, I know we're both in the radio and you know we have to communicate in other ways but getting together I mean I just think there's a lot of richness in that that um, is so important when when we can and and not be isolated not be so isolated. I do know that one of the things that's been helpful has been all the technology for getting you to be able to be in a room with 50 other people, Mm -hmm. (laughs) you know, on online and that sort of thing. But the other thing that is exciting to me is being able to take what we have as far as tech and then using it to really humanize a situation. And so, uh, there was a book written in the 90s called Future Shock, and that's where that context of high-tech, high-touch, they knew that as more and more technology came into our world, we would also have to have a high-touch element, not only to our businesses, but to our relationships. So we have about two minutes here. So Dr. Vic, do you want to kind of take a bite off of that and tell us what you think? Well, you know, community is so important. And one of the things I talk about on the show is to start producing the things we need in our own communities. Don't don't be waiting on other countries to be bringing food in or whatever. We need to learn, go back to maybe maybe go back to farming. uh, The big thing a while back was learn to code. How about learn to farm? How about learn to manufacture? How about learning to do things you know my my the best economy i can think of is the butcher the baker and the candlestick maker you know where your communities are self-sufficient and they're you know they're not reliant on outside help and their people are not sitting in their houses waiting for someone to feed them like a baby bird so you know i you know we have to learn self-actualization we have to learn to get the things that we need no matter what they are, you know, if the 12 steps of muscle, you know, we still got to have food and we got to have clean air and we've got to have water, you know, if they take those things away from us, we're really, we're really going to be hurting. I, I agree. Rebecca, you want to chime in with this last minute we have on this session? Well, I, I like what you were saying about touch. I think um, connectivity. I, I mean, I always hear that word as far as like, you know, the internet might my- my connectivity is down but having like that connectivity with other people and and I think it starts with ourselves. you know we have to be aware of where we're coming from what's important to us what we need and then meet other people physically as much as we can with hugs and 
warm greetings and just genuine concern. You know, the human element is so important. And we're going to talk more about bringing in the human element to your community when we come back from this quick break. So welcome back. This is Janine Bolin with the Janine Bolin Show. And with me today, I have Dr. Vic and Rebecca, who happen to be co-hosts here. And they also have their own radio show. Dr. Vic, how's it going on? And what we're talking about today is connectivity with your community. And we're also talking about how you go about making the type of life that you want. And this is not something where it's like power, positive thinking, stuff like that, although that can be very helpful. This is the to-do, the action items that you can go through through as you're walking through Maslow's 12 steps of self-actualization or whatever you want to talk about it. This is about really connecting with your community, such as I was lucky enough to be a friend of a 78-year-old woman who knew of a carousel that was going to be dismantled in one city, and she desperately wanted it brought to the city that we live in. And she was working with the city organizers, city planners. She was going to Chamber of Commerce meetings. She had a coffee club that we would meet every Saturday morning. Morning, we would talk about this carousel and bringing it to our city. And what was fascinating was just the community that she built all around this one little passion, not so little, it was a huge carousel, but, but we were looking for places and we were just learning so much about our community. And I had just moved to my community like six months previous. And so it was a delight to be able to talk to people who'd been in the town for over 20 years, telling all these stories, learning all this history. And so if you're finding that there isn't something right in what you have in your community, whether you are living in downtown Denver or whatever, uh, Dr. Vic, talk to us a little bit about how you chat with your students about how you go about making it happen for yourself. Talk to us a little bit about that. Well, one of the things that I, I try to get them to do is to reach out and do their own research. And they're always saying, couldn't you just give us that template? Couldn't you just give us this? Couldn't you just give us that? I said, I could, but I won't. I said, why not? I said, because if I give it to you, everybody would use this one, whether it fits your project or not, whether it was the best one for you or whatever, you would just do what I, that, what I put out there. So we have this great internet that we can go out on and look for things and you know do it what do it do their project that's that's totally them it's just like my dissertation um rebecca say when i read your dissertation it just sounded like you it was your you know it was your writing it was it was how you feel about things uh and that's what i think one of the things i had to i had to you know, step out in faith on this thing and, you know, to do this dissertation being the ADHD kid that they told me that I would never do anything but dig ditches. And, uh, you know, I just wanted to prove them wrong, I guess. I don't know. I wanted to figure out who I was, why I was the way I was. And I just, instead of being ADHD, and now I'm wired by the grace of God, you know, he put me this way for, for a special reason for me to be me, to see the world doesn't need another Moses or another Jesus or another um, prophet or any of these things or great businessman or whatever. He created me to be myself and I need to be the best self I can be. And I tell this to people all the time, no matter what you do, no matter how you feel, bring yourself best self to the table always. And I, I totally agree with that, but you also have so many wonderful tips. So that's what we're going to dig into is because of the background you've had and because of the challenges that you've experienced, you kind of have a process that you walk your students through. So like the first one you talked about was if you're not thriving where you are, take a step back. I mean, that's wonderful. Like take a step back to where, when you were thriving, start fresh and go from there. What are some other things like you're encouraging people to go out and be their best selves. Well, a lot of people feel very disconnected. So how do we connect with who we really are when we have a lot of messaging that's maybe against what we feel we really are? You know what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah. I understand that. And one of the things <laughs> me and Rebecca did, 
long time ago, probably 17, 18 years ago, we unplugged from the television. And we, we just, we didn't own a television. We didn't watch TV. We, we read books. We, you know, we, the internet hadn't really took off and there wasn't that much on there. And personally, I'm very disappointed in computers. I'm very disappointed in tech because I always expect so much more from it than what it does. And I'm like, I could do that. Doesn't, you know, they're not saving me time. They're actually costing me time because none of it works right. And then I fiddle around trying to get it to work. So I tell my students to be themselves, you know, to be, to be who they are. And don't look at the other person. And I would tell people at work that they'd say, well, what about this guy? I say, you don't like what he's doing? They'd say, no. I said, well, then quit looking at him. Quit watching him. Just do what went in front of you, you know. And I tell everybody that just do what's on your plate today. You know, don't worry about tomorrow or yesterday. Do what's on your plate. If you don't did, if you didn't do it yesterday, it's on your plate today. So, you know, just do what you need to do. Eventually, you need to make that happen for yourself. So when I was a young mother and I had four little kids under the age of seven and I was trying to run my business and write a book and I was working on my master's, so I had a lot going on. There were some days that I would be so burned out and so sleep deprived that all I could do was a load of dishes and a load of laundry. And that was a banner day. That was like, okay, because I found in my own systems, that laundry and dishes actually takes longer if you let it slide. So only do the things that won't make more time. Like you said, tech, like when people say, oh yeah, I'll just get on the computer and I'll crank that out. And I always go add 30 minutes because something inevitably will catch your attention because I have that shiny object syndrome, like a lot of business owners. This is why we're creative, by the way. This is why we're good at what we do is because we have that shiny object syndrome. So don't bust on yourself for that, but just be aware to set a timer. And that's been my saving grace. That's where tech helps me is that I have timers go off and I go, oh, 30 minutes has passed. Because I don't know about you, Rebecca, but if I get really focused in on what I'm doing, I'll forget to eat. I'll forget to sleep. I'll go for hours because I'm so engrossed in what I'm doing. So talk to us a little bit about how you can build to that level if that's not part of your nature. Well, um, for me, you're probably familiar with Marie Kondo. She used a phrase, um, keep the things that spark joy. She was the great organizer and cleaner person. And, and I like that idea of finding what brings us joy, like what do we love, what feeds us. And uh, for me, that might be going for a walk in nature. Um, I love soaking in the hot springs, you know, whenever I get a chance to do that. Um, being quiet and meditating, reading, I, I feel like it's so important to um, charge ourselves and to be to be self-responsible to be self-aware like what is it that I need what is it that I love what is it that I can give myself that will help me to be a better person and when I am like say well-fed spiritually or or well-fed um even physically you know I am able to do the things that are important to me and not get so off track because I can really get off track also. <laughs> There's so much that we can do and is that is out there. So what are some systems? You're, you're both such scholars. You're like me. We love our books. We love scholarly research. It, it's like a, it's, nothing is more exciting for me than to have a question that nobody has an answer to that's in my circle. And I'm like, oh, goody, guess what I'm doing for the next four hours, right? And I'm going to start digging. And then if I can't find it on the internet, my favorite thing in all the world is go to my local university library and start chatting it up with the librarians and they dig for stuff for me. And I, I'm sorry, that is something that turns my crank. So what do you do to help yourself stay in a thriving place? Being aware, really being aware, like being tuned into myself, um, you know, to the spirit guiding me. I mean, I just, I, I go a lot by my gut, I think intuition, you'd probably call it. And, um, you know, if I have that balance, you know, I'm good. If I have that balance, I just have to, uh, you know, be level with my meditating and, and spirituality 
and uh, be tuned in. And, and for me, you know, I love animals, <clears throat> cats, dogs, birds, wild animals. Those are the things that kind of center me and I think allow me to be my best self. And that is probably not true for everyone. Uh, not everyone may be really fed and nurtured by going for a walk in nature, although I think most people would be, but finding out what it is that, that brings you joy. So that way we can be respons self-responsible. You know, we are responsible for our own happiness and for our lives and for our health. And, you know, not to be kind of like drifting around and think, well, somebody can help me with this. You know, it's my body, it's my life. Um, and, you know, I, I want to be responsible for it. Right. And that's and, not something and, we're all taught, is it? Right. And therefore, um, I, one of the things, the tools that I use is positive self-talk, because as we all know, we can go the other way and it depletes us, depletes our energy and our motivation. But um, I can tell myself, I, I am excited about life and I am excited about my growth and I am excited about being healthy and strong. And, uh, you know, sometimes I lose that energy but I need to feed it in a positive way so I can, uh, I heard a wise man say this one time, um, you're going to end up wherever you're headed, you know, and I, it's, it's that simple, I think. Yeah, those simple phrases. So we have about two minutes, Dr. Vic, you want to chime in on this, dude? We'd love to hear well, that. I agree a lot with Rebecca, you know, we, we have several spots in Colorado and Wyoming where we go and we get recharged we get our energy recharged and we kind of do that once a month we get away for three four days and do that and when we moved from Missouri to Colorado Rebecca made me promise her that I'd take her to the mountains all the time so we've kept that up now for 11 years and you know Rebecca's a big force you know because she's always behind me and she she supports everything that I do and she not only so supports it, but she collaborates with me on it. And I value her opinion very much. And uh, I try to tell people it's like, we're not in competition, we're in collaboration. You know, you get the competition out of your mind. We're not competing against each other. We're collaborating to come up with the best answers. And that's hard to teach people. But when it they is, do it. It, it <laughs> it's a thing of beauty. And we're going to talk about collaboration connection and how you can move through this world with compassion when we come back after the break. Hey, welcome back. This is Janine Bowen and I am joined today by Dr. Vic and Rebecca who are hosts here on KHNC as well. And it's always so much fun when we get all of us in a room together, so to speak, talking, talking away about these things. So this, we were talking about collaboration, connection, and compassion. So I wanted to talk a little bit about definitions. I'm a scientist by training, and so one of the things I like to make sure is that we know what we're talking about. There is a difference between sympathy, empathy, and compassion. So let's just chat real quick that empathy and sympathy sometimes get confused. So Say somebody has recently died and you don't know what to say, the sympathetic answer to show that you connect with them as a human being, but you may not have any way of being able to express the emotions you're feeling, you will say, I am sorry for your loss. This is something we've done in our culture so that we can connect, but at the same time, when we don't know what to say, we don't say something stupid, right? <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> that may be that may be my thing. I don't want to sound stupid. I, I, that's one of the things is I, I'd like to be able to say something that's comforting. Now, empathy is maybe your mom has also died. And so this person's mother has died. And so you have very empathy and you're like, I know how you feel. I'm so sorry for your loss. However you want to say that, that's empathy. What we're going for, though, as business owners, as leaders, as dreamers, as people that are music makers, however you identify yourself as a creative, we go for compassion. And this is what the Buddha was talking about, which is we don't try to connect with people at a level that is insultive, which is, do I truly know how this woman is feeling? Maybe she didn't get along with her mother. Maybe she's clicking her heels in the back office thinking, finally, I'm out from under this woman, right? You don't know. So 
compassion says, I know you're going through something, but I don't necessarily know all the details. And so, Rebecca, you were talking to us about connecting and compassion and connection are very, very similar. So talk to us about how you were describing people listening and connecting with those in their community to build their community. Uh, talk to us a little bit about how somebody can learn to do that because no, no offense to the younger generation, they're not taught how to listen. They're taught sit still and hear what I'm pumping into your brain. They're not really taught how to listen. So any pointers you want to give us? Um, I was thinking about uh, Dr. Emoto, the Japanese doctor, Marsua, Mar Marsua um, Emoto, I think is his first name. And uh, he did the study where he tested water and he, he would freeze water, look at it under a microscope and it would be very chaotic. You know, it would be polluted and, uh, you know, didn't have any form or symmetry to it. And he would uh, write love or compassion or joy or peace or beauty and uh, put, just put that word you know, on a piece of paper on the bottle of water and leave it there for a while. He would refreeze the water and look at it again under a microscope. And you can look at it on the internet. Uh, just the most beautiful forms. They look like snowflakes, just beautiful crystals, like something you might see in a cathedral uh, from the word love. And, and his um, kind of the synopsis of that was, is that our consciousness can change things things start in our mind. They start with how we're feeling. And I really can't give to another person what I don't have myself. If I don't have self-compassion or I don't have self-love, and you know, it sounds kind of weird. I keep saying it kind of goes back to ourself. But if I have, you know, self-beauty, self-wisdom, self-love, self-compassion, I can connect to other people on that level and and see that in you and i can love what i see in you because i can appreciate what is in me so if i'm not healed if i'm not in a, in a good state of mind spiritually i don't really have anything to give another person anything positive anyway yeah we can be a part of the problem sure we yeah. can add to that can't we we're champions yeah. at that <laughs> yeah. yeah complaining or criticizing and right and so being able to really listen to another person to hear them, uh, what are some techniques that you use to really hear what another person is saying? Or uh, what do they call it? Uh, conscious listening or um, active? There we go. Active listening. Yeah. Well, I try to make eye contact and then just uh, let the person talk and not interrupt and listen to what they're saying and not try to... Um, anticipate what I'm going to say next in response to that to sound clever or impressive, which I, I could do that, but just having practicing humility and letting the person uh, speak and finish their thought. And um, it, it's so important to be heard. I mean, everyone wants to be heard. When I was younger, I was just uh, critically, cripplely, crippledly shy. And um I had a I had a um, a back brace that I wore. I had a, a back problem. I had to wear it for four years, and people would come up to me and say, "What happened to you?" And I learned that people people want to be heard. They they want to be listened to. I was so self centered and and afraid about what will I say and so embarrassed. But I realized everybody wants to be appreciated and everyone wants to be heard, and we can give that to one another because everyone does have a voice. And that's one of the neat things about tech in my mind is that we're actually being able to hear people that otherwise wouldn't, people who are bedridden, who can do YouTube channels now because they have the ability and stuff like that. So there are times where tech is incredibly infuriating, but then I also look at all these people that have a voice and a platform that didn't before. And that brings us to Dr. Vic, because we were talking about collaboration and compassionate collaboration when you're collaborating for the good of more than yourself right so talk to us a little bit about you were talking dr vick you were saying hey there isn't get rid of uh, the competition get rid of competition out of your brain talk about collaboration and how we can do that compassionately well one of the things that that i had learned in my studies and and that i use a lot and 
it's um, in the action research. And that's uh, where we, when we have a group of people, maybe six or eight, and we go around the room and we let people talk and we dialogue, we do not debate, we do not cross talk, we do not answer people's stuff. We just say what we wanna say. And we put it in themes and then we, we sort it out and we find out, we get a consensus of how we move forward on a problem that we had or on a new process. Um, I don't like to fix pro problems. I like to find new processes. I mean, I'm not a problem solver. I'm a, I'm a new process person. And I cannot do this alone without collaboration. I look to the people on my teams. I look to other professors. I look to things and, you know, I put things out and we, we get together and we dialogue. And we always use the third one I couldn't think of was appreciative inquiry where you always put a positive, you don't go in the negative, you always do the positive. And I do that with people and I want them to know I'm listening to them because I'll repeat back. I hear what you're saying here. You, this, is where, this is where you're having the problem. And well, how do we move forward from this? Do we, you know, we can collaborate on that. I can help you. I want you to know I got your back. I'll help you any way I can, but I can't solve your problems but I can help you find processes. And that's what I do with them. I, I let them know that I hear them and we can, find a, we can find a solution, always stay in the solution. And that's what I tell people when I collaborate, let's stay in the solution. Let's don't get into the negative. Let's look, let's look at the positive. Because you have to start somewhere, you might as well move in a direction that's at least pointing to where you believe a solution will be, even if the solution doesn't end up being there. But I, I need you to back up. Appreciative inquiry. Educate me on that a little bit more. I'm not thoroughly sold on the concept. Like, I don't have a really good definition in my head for what that means. So can you give me an example or two on that to kind of help it with my brain? Well, that was kind of like when we started, um, when I would ask people what was the project or the uh, product or whatever it was that they did well. And instead of, trying to fix the problem where they're at, I tell them, let's do what you do well. That's appreciative inquiry. Stay in the positive, stay in the solution. Um, don't go, don't drift back into the negative on problem solving. Look for processes, look for, look for what people do well. And, you know, I had, when we had our business in Missouri, I would have people come to work and you know, they were having problems. And I brought one, one man in, Charlie. I said, Charlie, if you could do whatever you wanted to do, what, anything you could do, what would it be? And he thought about it. He says, I love to paint cars. I said, really, you're a painter? And he said, yeah. I said, well, I got about a million pounds of iron out there in the yard that needs to be painted. I said, and I have no idea what kind of, um, you know, paint system to have or whatever. I said, if you were gonna buy a uh, airless sprayer, what would you buy? And he said, well, this is the one I would buy if, if, you know, for the company. And I said, Charlie, if I bought you that machine, would you paint? And he was my best employee after that. I bet. <laughs> That's I what bet. I do with all of them, you know? Yeah. yeah. And it, it's, I was going to say, it's also like uh, I've read a lot of stories where people will retire from their job and they've done something they didn't really enjoy. And then they retire and then they start following the passion of their heart, something they just love, maybe a hobby. And they, they just do, they just rock it. You know, they're, they make a lot of money. They're having fun. They have a great business, just doing what they love. And that, that is where we all want to go. So, okay. You guys are delightful. I absolutely love chatting with you. How can people get to know you better? Where do you, where can we send them? Like, do you have a website? Talk to us uh, if you don't mind, Dr. Vic. Well, I had a website and, uh, the people that were doing it weren't doing a very good job on it, so I had to shut it down. So and they weren't your painter then? Obviously not a painter. No, okay, man. moving on. <laughs> that was a bad deal, but they can contact me at uh, at my number at 720-705-1018. Rebecca, how about you? How can people get a hold of you? Um, I have a, a phone number, 720-422-0930. Sounds fabulous. Thank you both so much for being on the show today. I really appreciate you both. Thank you, Janine, for having us. It's really been great. 
you know, we're just really happy to welcome you to the KHNC team. And uh, we're on we're on at three o'clock on Sunday. And I, I think you said noon on Sunday. You were gonna that's be right. On. Yep. That's where we are. So oh. thank you so much, you guys. Appreciate having you. And this is Janine Bolin with the Janine Bolin Show. See you next Sunday. Thank you for listening to the Janine Bolin Show. Be sure to subscribe to our show notes by going to the JanineBolinShow.com where you'll find additional resources as well as the opportunity to sign up to receive our program in your email each week. Be sure to visit our sponsor at the8gates.com.